Hello, I'm Mr. Cotton, and this video will cover cells, viruses, membranes, and transport. We'll start off by doing a review of cells and viruses, and then we'll work on a few sample questions, old star questions and such. Then we'll actually do the questions first before we talk about cell transport and cell membranes, and then we'll come over and kind of review it this way. So we'll kind of do it slightly different ways. Um, to start off with, Let's say that this is our cell. So this is our cell membrane. Everything over here is inside the cell. Everything over here is outside the cell. I start off with my nucleus. Um, there are enzymes out here that can destroy DNA. So my nucleus doesn't just hold DNA, it protects my DNA. And my DNA might be wrapped around histone proteins so it doesn't get tangled up. Well, let's say that I wanna read this DNA, eventually build a protein, and then like ship it out of a cell. So, the first thing I have to do is transcription. And in transcription, I convert DNA language into RNA language. Transcription. All right, so here's my strand of RNA. And it might leak out of the cell. And if it stays just a big, long, single strand, then it's messenger RNA. Sometimes it'll fold up into weird shapes grab amino acids and become a transfer RNA. Um, or it might fold up, join with proteins, and become a ribosome. That's R RNA. So this is a ribosome. The job of a ribosome is to read mRNA, messenger RNA, and then build the proteins that it is coding for, that it has instructions for. So let's say that this ribosome is gonna build this protein right here. So this is the chain of amino acids. Uh, that make up the protein that's coming out the top. As this thing slides along, it's building the protein. Well, a lot of times, the protein that we build is supposed to eventually exit the cell. And if we're gonna exit the cell, we have to package it. We do that in the ER. We have to chemically tag it. We do that in the Golgi before we send it out. So if that's the case, there'll be a special code on this RNA whenever the ribosome grabs it that says, hey, we're gonna package this. So then the ribosome will go and land on the ER. So the endoplasmic reticulum. So now I've got my ribosome maybe, and it lands on the ER here. So here's the piece of mRNA going through there that he reads. And then here's the piece of protein that he builds. So he starts building this protein. He'll build the protein and shove it into the hollow part of the ER. Again, the main job of the ER is to package um, something. If it's packaging something from a ribosome, ribosomes make proteins. So the rough ER, that means it's covered in ribosomes, will always be packaging proteins. Smooth ER packages other stuff. So if we're going to send out um, one of the other biomolecules like lipids or carbohydrates or something like that, then that would come from smooth ER. But both of them have in common that they package stuff. So this just sort of like pinches off kind of like a lava lamp. This is made of phospholipid bilayer. It's continuous with the nuclear membrane, you'll notice. And so it kind of pinches off. And when it does pinch off, then now we have to transport it over here to the Golgi apparatus. Golgi is always capitalized because it was named after a person. So this little guy will kind of help us out. He'll carry this broken off protein. His name is kinesin, kinetic kinesin movement. And so he'll carry this vesicle over to the Golgi apparatus. Well, that's phospholipid bilayer. That's phospholipid bilayer. So picture when you're like, like blowing bubbles when you're a kid, like soap bubbles. If I have a soap bubble and a soap bubble and they bump into each other, sometimes they combine and just make one big soap bubble. So these will combine. And it's almost sort of like the blue is getting absorbed, so to speak, by the black. And now... My protein is inside the hollow Golgi apparatus. Well, as I move from left to right through all these stacks of the Golgi apparatus, I add these little chemical modifications. So maybe it'll be blue. It's cruising through here this way. Add another chemical. Cruise through this way. Add another chemical. Doesn't matter what they are, but usually the chemicals are either phosphates or some type of carbohydrate. And then now it's packaged. This will pinch off. This guy, kinesin, another kinesin will carry it. 
This is phospholipid bilayer. So when you get to the very edge of the cell, they just merge. And so now this guy that was being carried along, there you go. Now he gets dumped out into say the bloodstream. And now maybe this was like insulin. Um, that's a protein. I know it's a protein because it ends in IN. IN, EN, or ACE are typically proteins. So maybe this gets dumped into my bloodstream and now it can go and, and help do its job controlling my blood sugar. All right, so that's how these work. So the nucleus protects DNA. Transcription happens in there. Ribosomes do translation. They read the mRNA that leaks out of the nuclear pores and build protein from it. If we eventually have to ship that protein somewhere, then we package it in the endoplasmic reticulum. If ribosomes are on the ER, we call it rough. If they're absent from the ER, we call it smooth. We then package that protein, send it to the Golgi apparatus. And this chemical tag is gonna allow this protein to interact with some cells and not others. So way over here somewhere, maybe I've got a cell. Like maybe this is a, a brain cell. And maybe this is a heart cell. Well, let's say that I want this particular chemical to interact with heart cells, but not brain cells. Okay. I'll have a receptor that fits that hat. My brain cells, they don't. They have receptors maybe that look like this, so it doesn't fit. So the chemical tag that Golgi put on there determines what kind of cells I interact with. So that's why we'll say it like gives the protein an address, so to speak. All right, um, next up, we got the mitochondria. I know it's the powerhouse of the cell and it does make energy. Um, that's not incorrect to say, but I think it kind of creates a misconception. So I like to say it converts energy because what we're doing is we're taking food energy. That's still a type of energy. It's just a type of energy that my cells can't really run on. My cells run on ATP. So I convert carbohydrates or whatever into ATP. That's a mitochondria. This is a chloroplast. Their job is to convert sunlight energy into food. Um, one common misconception is that students will think, hey, because um, plants have chloroplasts, they don't need mitochondria. That's actually not true because chloroplasts just get you food, but cells don't run on food. Cells run almost exclusively on ATP. So I still need mitochondria to convert. So as an animal, I don't have chloroplasts. So what do I do instead to get food? I eat. I'm a heterotroph. This is an autotrophic thing, making food yourself. Um, I'm hetero. I have to get food from someplace different. Hetero is different. So I convert food energy to ATP in my mitochondria, regardless of whether I'm a plant or an animal. Okay, one last thing before we get into some questions, some practice questions. Um, over here on the side, I've got a virus and a different virus. So this virus has a protein capsid and the genetic material inside is DNA. That's why I drew it double helix. This virus over here has a protein capsid and inside it has RNA. Most viruses that you think of um, are RNA viruses. Um, SARS-CoV-2, the cause for COVID-19 is not. So the way that a virus kind of works, the way that a virus can harm us or make us sick is they will have proteins on the outside that allow them to get inside of a cell. So I might have a protein over here in my cell membrane and maybe it's a receptor and it does something completely apart from a virus, it has a job. Well, that virus kind of hijacks that, it uses that, uses that as a weakness and now it can enter the cells. Kind of like at your home, you might have a window. Well, it has a job, I can let a breeze through, you know? But if there was a crook and they wanted to break into my house, they might utilize that against me. So the window's not there to let in thieves. It's there for something, and then a thief sort of exploits that. That's what this virus is doing. So this receptor has some function. This virus is going to attach to it. You'll notice that that is complementary. I have a triangle, and then that's complementary like a puzzle piece to fit that triangle. So this virus fits that receptor. That's why this virus can infect this cell. This virus over here has different proteins. They don't fit. So that's why this virus can't infect this cell. So that's why like hepatitis can only infect my liver, for example. And flu can't infect my liver. Uh, flu is infecting my respiratory um, pathway. Why does one virus infect the, these cells but not these? It usually has to do with the protein shapes. 
So my liver cells um, have different receptors than my lung cells, than my brain cells. So different viruses can sort of break into different types of cells. Once they get in there, your, your cell is now a virus factory because this DNA or this RNA, whichever one gets inside of your cells, I guess in this example, the DNA, once the DNA is in here, then now it's going to tell your cells like, hey, start making more viruses. And your cells like, all right, my cells do whatever genetic code tells them to do. Okay, so now with that, let's try a few sample questions. Um, whenever you do your Google form, you'll have a total of about eight or 10 of these questions that we'll cover in class. And then there'll be a few extra that we don't get to during this kind of like video session. So you might have to like review your notes or look them up or something. Okay, so this one right here says, some students used information they gathered from lab investigations to prepare a table. They entered the table in their lab notebooks. All right, fine. Cell one versus cell two. It says cell one is smaller than five micrometers. Cell two is larger than 10 micrometers. All right, so cell one's smaller. Cell one does not have a nucleus. Cell two does have a nucleus. All right, immediately, I know this is a prokaryotic cell. Prokaryotic, pro before. Like if I'm proactive, um, then I notice maybe these two students are in an argument. If I'm proactive and I can kind of break it up before it turns into a fight, proactive. Um, so this does not have a nucleus. It's prokaryote. Karyote is, is kernel or nucleus. So prokaryotes, um, they evolved before there was a nucleus. So that's a prokaryotic cell. Does it have membrane bound organelles? Another example of a prokaryotic cell. Bacteria, they have circular DNA. So um, this probably wouldn't matter really on a star test. Typically, this is an old star, star uh, question. But if we look at this, their DNA, it wouldn't be in a nucleus like this. But when they say it's circular, it's still double helix. It just joins at both ends. Ours stays like a, like a strand. All right. Um, so now... Which of these correctly identifies the two cells described above? Well, uh, cell one is a prokaryotic cell. Cell two is a eukaryotic cell. Cool. All right, next. Get my mouse. My mouse is being a little bit finicky. Okay, next up, we've got HIV, that's a virus, and an animal cell. What's the difference in the function of the glycoprotein structures of an HIV and the cilia on an animal cell. Those are the glycoproteins. So what's the function of these versus these? Well, in an animal cell, cilia or flagella, flagella and cilia are structurally the same. It just, uh, flagella is usually, instead of having many of them, you usually have a, a small number, one, two, or three, and they're really, really long. But structurally on the inside, they work the same way. So um, the job of those cilia in an animal cell is to help them swim around. HIV, we just mentioned over here that the whole function of that is to help invade a cell. So here, the glycoproteins are actually helping me to pull myself inside of a cell. It's not helping me swim or, or anything like that. So the glycoproteins are used for attachment, true, and the cilia are used to move fluids surrounding the cell. That's true. So when these kind of wave, almost like they're like, waving um, that can either help the cell move or it can help the fluid move by the cell just like if I'm in a pool I can either use my arms like this to help me move in the pool or if I'm stationary I can go like this and I'm kind of pushing the fluid past me while I stay in the same spot all right let's see what we have next um, viruses can be transmitted through air water food insect bites and direct skin contact once a virus gains entry into the body, it invades a host in order to, so take a second, you think it's deactivate the host cell's defenses, synthesize antibodies for defense, metabolize host proteins and grow, or access cellular processes for replication. So a virus, we consider it non-living because it can't do anything on its own. It's just code. So it's not really running its own metabolism. It's not metabolizing host proteins. Um, 
but it can access cellular processes for replication. It basically says, here's the code, cell, you make copies of me. So the right answer is access cellular processes so that it can replicate. Next, which cellular process takes place in the ribosomes that are bound to the ER? So back over here, make this just a little bit bigger on this one so you can kind of see. You might remember that mRNA ribosomes, they make proteins. If they're attached to the ER, then that's rough ER, and they're manufacturing proteins. So breakdown of waste, no, that's more of a lysosome thing. Conversion of radiant energy to glucose, no, that sounds like a chloroplast. The synthesis of new proteins, yeah. It's not replicating nucleic acids, that'd be inside the nucleus. So synthesizing new proteins. Let's shrink this down so it's not a problem on the next question. Okay. Come on, mouse. There we go. Um, this picture shows a 3D model of a virus called a bacteriophage. Bacteriophages can infect bacteria such as E. coli. In what way are the bacteriophage and E. coli alike? In what way are the bacteriophage and the E. coli alike? So, they contain antibodies. They reproduce by mitosis. They have identical genomes. They lack membrane-bound organelles. Well, they don't contain antibodies. Antibodies is like a defense system in your immune system, so that's no good. They reproduce by mitosis. No, only cells repro reproduce by mitosis, only eukaryotic cells. And um, prokaryotic cells, like bacteria, they reproduce by a different method. It's called binary fission. That's unlikely to show up on a star test. And then viruses also don't reproduce by mitosis. They don't have identical genomes, or they'd be the same thing. Right. If I have an identical genome to somebody else, then that's my identical twin. So the only thing left, they lack membrane-bound organelles. That's true. A virus is just a protein capsid and inside some genetic material. They can have some other stuff, um, but that's all that's required to be a virus. And then bacteria are prokaryotic cells. So that means that they also evolved before the nucleus. You've got a couple more questions that are going to show up that are some on-your-own questions. So good luck with those. Next up, we're gonna to move to membrane transport. So let's flip back to this other camera over here. Um, no, I think I had said that I was gonna show you the questions first. All right. So the picture shows a contractile vacuole of a unicellular freshwater organism. Like, okay. Uh, the contractile vacuole regulates the flow of water into and out of the cell in an aquatic environment. Okay, so I see a bunch of stuff in there. If it was a prokaryotic cell, all I would actually be able to see, like when you're adding stuff on the inside, is genetic material and ribosomes. Sure, there's some cytosol, some cell solution in there, but like I don't really draw that. Otherwise, they're missing pretty much everything else. So this is a eukaryotic cell. Okay, so this says, what conditions cause the contractile vacuole to fill with water? The concentration of water is greater outside the cell than inside. The temperature of the water in the vacuole is higher than the temperature of its environment. The concentration of water inside the cell is the same as the concentration outside the cell. The temperature of the water in the vacuole is lower than the temperature of its environment. So we haven't talked about this one yet, but vacuoles are basically just a giant storage container. So plants might store, like if I'm a potato, um, that's where I'm storing starch. So I can store, you know, like something for energy, like starch. I can also store water in there. Um, so it turns out with, um, I think I just mentioned, yeah. And so it turns out this is a contractile vacuole. And so they can contract. So they can like fill up with water and then squirt it out. That's what the contractile means. So if water is entering then that means there's a higher water concentration on the outside than there is on the inside. So let's go and check out that concept real quick. Back over here on the board. So let's say this is my phospholipid bilayer and um, I've got different kinds of particles. So as a general rule, if something is nonpolar, it can get through the cell membrane more easily than something that's polar. 
If something's smaller, it can get through more easily than if it's large. So let's say that these pink things right here are um, nonpolar and they're small enough. Well, which way will the pink things move? Well, there's more on the inside, looks like 10 or 12 or something, and there's like three out here. So they'll move from a high concentration to a low concentration. Anytime there's a difference in concentration, two, four, six, eight, 10, 10 versus three, then we say there's a concentration gradient. And since we're moving from the number 10 to the number three, we're moving down the concentration gradient. So we move from 10 to three, and they're gonna keep moving until they're about equal on both sides. And we'll call that equilibrium. And so there's six. All right, there you go, now it's perfect. Um, that one was never there. And so they'll move until they're equal on both sides. This is called simple diffusion, unless it's water moving. When water moves, um, it's osmosis. Technically, it's water moving through a channel, but if water's moving from high to low concentration, then we call that osmosis. And if it's anything else, we just call it diffusion. So if sodium's moving from high to low, we call it sodium diffusion. If calcium's moving from high to low, we call it calcium diffusion. If it's chlorine, it's chlorine diffusion. But if it's water, we're like, oh no, that's called osmosis. And this does not require energy on the part of the cell because things just naturally move from high to low. Your teacher probably gave you an example of like, if there's smoke in the corner or if I light something on fire and it starts to smoke, the smoke will just spread out even, evenly throughout the room. So molecules move until they're even, so long as they can. If they can't get through that barrier, then they can't. So if there was smoke in the hallway and it can't penetrate the wall, then it can't. All right, so now let's go back to our question and see what it was asking us here. Shrink that down a bit. So what conditions cause the contractile vacuole to fill with water? Well, if they're filling up with water and they're on the inside, that means water is moving from high to low concentration. So the concentration of water is greater outside the cell than inside the cell. Contractile vacuoles have nothing to do with temperature. So those were just distractors, the two related to temperature. All right, let's try another one. This one is not an old star question, but it's a really good one. The student put together the experiment shown below. The selectively permeable, that means some things selective, permeable, get through, is permeable to both types of solute molecules. So there might be some other molecules in another part of the question that it wasn't permeable to. So we're permeable to both. I noticed that side A has a mixture of black dots and white dots. Side B is only white dots. That's probably gonna be significant. All the following will occur in this situation except. So three of these statements are true, one's false. You're looking for the false one. All right, so let's look at them. Molecule C, molecule C is the dark ones. I see two, four, six, eight of them over here. Molecule C will decrease on side A. This is side A, all right? B, molecule C and D will be able to move through the membrane. All right, C, molecule D concentration will decrease on side B. And D, molecule C will remain highly concentrated on side A. So take a second. All right, great. So molecule C concentration will decrease on side A. Molecule C, I've got two, four, six, eight of these dark ones and zero over here. This membrane is permeable to both of them, so won't about half of them, won't about four of them eventually end up over here? So doesn't that mean that it's true? Molecule C concentration will decrease. It'll go from eight on side A to about four. So that's a true statement. We want the except, we want the false one. So A is true, but we want the false. All right, molecule C and D will be able to move through the membrane. That is true, it says they're both permeable. So that is true, but we want the except. We want the false one. Molecule D, that's the, the white ones. Molecule D concentration will decrease on side B. That's also true. For the white ones, I've got two, four, six, seven, and then I've got more than seven. So they're gonna move from right to left until they're about equal. So that is also true. Hopefully, this one's false because we're looking for the false one. Molecule C will remain highly concentrated on side A. No, um, about half of these are gonna move over to there. So that is our false statement, that is our accept. So the right answer was molecule C will remain highly concentrated 
on side A. All right, next up, this diagram shows cellular activity across a cell membrane. Which two processes does this diagram most directly model? Now, this is an old star question, and it's um, pretty tricky, but um, we kept it on here anyway, so let's walk through it. Which two processes does this diagram most directly model? So, got some dots, got some dots. Uh, it says glucose. Okay, the dots are glucose. They're in higher concentration outside, lower concentration inside. All right, so it looks like they're moving from high to low through a channel. And okay, so energy conversions and synthesis of new molecules. Now we're not making, synthesis is making, we're not synthesizing new molecules. We're just moving stuff around. So that answer is no good. Synthesis of new molecules? Nope, I don't have to read any farther. If I'm taking a star test, I will, but I'm not synthesizing new molecules new molecules. So that answer is no good. Next up, transport of molecules. I agree. And energy conversions. This is where it seems kind of odd. And so, yes, this is moving, but the cell's not providing the energy. So yeah, I understand that if I have a high concentration here and a low concentration there, and then they start moving, that's like kinetic energy. I'm kind of going from potential to kinetic. Um, and so that's why this question, I don't really like that much, but I wanted to give it to you because it was number 28 on a star test one year. So let's look at the next answer choice and see if it's better. Hopefully it's better because this one bothers me. Homeostasis and transport of molecules. Yes. So transport of molecules, I'm moving molecules. And homeostasis is basically a cell doing whatever it needs to do to um, operate in the way it's supposed to. It's not always just keeping equilibrium. It's not always keeping stuff exactly the same. It's kind of like keeping stuff the same by doing something drastic. So for example, um, I know that sounds puzzling. So for example, homeostasis. If my body temperature is supposed to stay pretty steady, 98, 99 degrees, if it's 30 in the room, I do something drastic. My brain involuntarily makes every muscle in my body pretty much contract and I shiver. That creates friction, that heats me up. Or let's say it's 90 degrees, then my body covers itself in water and I cool off. So homeostasis is doing whatever is necessary um, to like fit your environment properly or to maintain equilibrium. So you might do something drastic to keep something steady state. So that's what we're doing. We're bringing glucose into the cell because apparently we need it, right? It's energy. All right. Let's get in one or two more. Some students use vinegar to dissolve away the shells of three eggs and use these eggs as models of human red blood cells. The students ob observed the changes in the eggs when they were placed in different solutions. Red blood cell model in different solutions. Okay, so which statement best describes the role of the cell membrane in this model? Um, okay, the cell membrane is, in, is an impermeable barrier that prevents water from entering the cell. No, like I can see that the cell is changing in size as I, as I go, so it's not impermeable, so that's no good. B, the cell membrane allows solutes to enter the cell, which causes the cell to shrink. Well, it's actually the, the solute is like the, the solid part, like usually salt or uh, sugar or something like that. So it's actually allowing the solvent, it's allowing water to enter and exit. So that one's kind of tricky if you aren't familiar with what a solute is. B's no good. C, the cell membrane allows water to enter and leave the cell. Yes, that's the right answer. So the reason that this one has water exiting the cell is here, inside the cell, inside the cell, it's not pure water, right? There's all of this stuff. So inside the cell is less than 100% water. Let's say, you know, I always hear things like we're about 70% water, 65% water. Well, if I'm put into a beaker full of pure water, outside is 100% water, Inside is, let's say, 70. So water is going to move from high water concentration to low, osmosis, across the membrane, and the cell is going to expand. Over here, if I'm in really sugary water, then now um, there's more water inside the cell, maybe 70%. Outside is maybe only 50%, so now water leaves and the cell shrinks. So this is osmosis. Okay. Um, there are a few other questions. There's about four more, it looks like. 
that you'll do on your own whenever you fill out the form. But I wanted to show you one last thing over here. If something can't get through the cell membrane very easily on its own, like this, then I can use a channel. A channel opens it up. So maybe this is polar, and so it can't actually get through the membrane very well. Maybe it's like something like this. He's bouncing off of the phospholipid bilayer. But if I open up a channel, he can slide right through from high to low concentration. That's passive. So the cell does not provide energy. He just naturally moves from high to low. This is simple diffusion, moving from high to low. This is what they call facilitated diffusion because it's helped. Facilitate means to help. It's helped by that, that protein channel. And then the last thing that we'll look at is a pump. So this is a protein pump. And sometimes, maybe I hate blue dots. I mean, who doesn't? So I've only got two here, and I've got six on the outside, but I don't want any of them. So I can pump them. This requires energy because normally things naturally flow from high to low. But if I want to burn energy, thanks to my mitochondria producing some ATP, I can power this pump and I can move these guys out against the concentration gradient. Normally we flow with the concentration gradient from high, then it flowed down to low until we reached equilibrium. In this example, we're flowing from low to high, but that requires energy. That's one of the primary reasons why you have to eat food is because you're running pumps in your body. Okay, don't forget, in order to get credit for this, you need to go and fill out the Google form answer sheet. And most of the questions are the ones that we've discussed. And then there's a few extras on top of that. Make sure you put your name, your uh, teacher, and just fill out all the fields. So see you next time. Thank you.